So it's really nice to meet everyone. My name is Deborah Rue. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be talking about Bullion Strong. So uh, I have a long career in this field. And before I joined this field as an entrepreneur, I was in the banking industry for 25 years. So yes, I am over 60. Uh, but I'm really proud of Rue Global Impact, not necessarily the name because I meant to name it something else, but I thought I'd put a placeholder there and yeah, and got away from me. But we, I'm very proud that we are, you know, supporting multinational corporations all over the world and helping guide the conversation. And um, Cameron mentioned that you're going to talk about the SDGs next time. The sustainable development goals are so important to our world, to accessibility, to true inclusion. So I appreciate that um, you're taking, you're talking about those things. Uh, I am a market influencer, according to social media, and um, speaker for the United Nations, and for uh, anyway, I, 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 for a lot of people, the speakers. Um, I mean, the State Department. Um, but more importantly, I identify as a person with lived experiences with disabilities, and I'm very proud to say that I'm a person with a disability. Um, I have ADHD, and I have, um, like everyone else, deal with a lot of mental health issues, especially during these intense times. Um, I'm the, a mother of a daughter that's now 34 years old that was born with Down syndrome, and my husband of almost 40 years has uh, aged into dementia due to a traumatic brainhood, um, a traumatic brain injury when he was a child who was hit by a car. So this very personal topic to me of true inclusion, and you cannot be truly included if you're not accessible. And I see that over and over and over again. So we're going to talk about that a um, little way through, but I don't want to brag about myself. I have a lot of expertise. I've been blessed to have accolades and stuff, but it's not really, th this work isn't about me. So let me go. Sorry. No, it's right there. Let me go. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so um, I've been doing this work. Uh, I started Tech Access, was it, which was a technology company focused on ICT accessibility. And I uh, partnered with Thomas Logan, the Equal Entry, and so many others in the accessibility field. And uh, the majority of my employees, I was very proud, were technologists with disabilities. And in 2011, that firm merged with what the firm that is now called Level Access. So, and then I started um, Rue Global Impact because I saw that corporations were trying to include us, but I didn't feel they were doing a good job of telling society what they were doing. And so I started looking at this more from a strategic, how do we make sure we're truly included? And just as an example, and I'm not going to be mean and name it, but there is... I'm sorry. Um, there are, you know, indexes and stuff that will tell corporations about how well they're doing it about including people with disabilities, but they don't look at whether or not you're accessible or your website's accessible or your apps are accessible, which will prevent people with disabilities um, being employed. And if you're a customer with disabilities, getting access to the information. So we continue to see accessibility, um, not thought about an afterthought. And I know I personally am tired of that. And I'm starting to speak louder about that. So we have over a billion people with disabilities in the world. So we created Billion Strong as a global nonprofit to focus on bringing us individually together. So this is not about providing services to corporations or anything else. This is about bringing us together, people with disabilities together all over the world, people that love somebody with a disability, our allies, the intersections, bring us all together because if we came together in strength and then companies weren't being accessible or they weren't including us or they were letting us go because they don't want to accommodate us or it's too much trouble to get a sign language interpreter, we have a much more powerful voice together. So that's why we created Billion Strong. There's been so many things that have happened in the world. I actually should on this screen plop a big COVID-19 sign on top of it because the world has changed dramatically globalization, medical advances, technology. We had years ago this, the, 
the CRPD. Um, we have the digital divide actually getting larger, especially during COVID-19. We have companies looking at corporate social responsibility and corporate digital responsibility, but it feels to me like a lot of it is not really um, part of the mainstream efforts. It just feels once again, like it's an afterthought. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example of that. I'll put up this slide while I say it. Um, I work a lot with the United Nations and we were working with a group that um, they were not part of the United Nations, but a lot of them were for former UN leaders. And they were building this really cool portal where they were going to bring together all these nonprofits that are focused on the sustainable development goals. And, um, and so they showed us this beautiful website, really well done, very searchable. And of course, I asked the question, is, is it, is it accessible. And they came back and said, and I was shocked when they said this, just because there were some really high, um, some pretty influential leaders on here. And they were saying, well, we did. And it was too much trouble. I don't know that people with disabilities are really using it. And it, it's too expensive. And we'll do that later. And so I said, oh, that's what we always hear. And I can no longer be part of this because I'm not going to be part of something that doesn't include all of us. And so there is something very important happening here, which was one reason why I was blessed that Thomas and uh, Merle invited me to come and speak about this. But we do have 1 billion, 1.3 billion people, which is approximately 15% of the population, probably higher. But those numbers are one in seven people with disabilities. And we see more and more countries saying one in five or the states, we have one in four adult Americans identifying as having a disability. One in four, that's 25%. So the numbers continue to grow and they're growing all over the world and they're partially growing all over the world because also we are an aging society all over the world. And so by 2050, the world's population age 16 over is expected to hit 2 billion. And we have approximately seven and a half billion people in the world um, here in the States. And by the way, I realize my numbers are wrong, but there are 70 plus million baby boomers. I'm one of those, but they're now age 57 and older. So the youngest baby boomer is 57. The oldest is 75. And the reality is the baby boomers still they still control the majority of the wealth. So there's a lot of wealth distribution that's going to be changing hands to the, the Gen Xs and the millennials and stuff, but still the baby boomers are still controlling the wealth. So as people age, they, they um, age sometimes into disabilities. According to the AARP, quite often into disabilities, uh, about 46% of Americans over the age of 65 have disabilities. And that's not a threat. It's just part of being a human being. But we see with those people and people with disabilities, the tech gap is widening. We see five generations in the workforce and we see generational fighting and misunderstanding. Um, there's cultural differences because of this. Cybersecurity, the reason why I bring up cybersecurity is because unfortunately people with disabilities and the elderly are targeted more um, with cybersecurity than any other group. It, it's really sort of chilling what happens to the, the, these people in um, our society. And then of course, I bring up aging in place because us baby boomers don't wanna do what my generation did and put our elders in nursing homes. We wanna work uh, and live and play and age in place. So all of these things are impacting us pretty substantially. <clears throat> Another thing to consider is that when I talk to corporations, which I do all the time, I don't want them to think about including people with disabilities as always a charity. Just because you're including people with disabilities doesn't mean it's a charity, not when there are so many of us. And um, if you are not looking at including us from the perspective of return on investment, return on the expense, anything else you do, then you are treating us like you have to a charity or somebody you got to take care of. So it's very important that corporations include us in a very meaningful ways, which means everything you do has to be accessible, just speaking from the accessibility lens. So I'm glad that we now have corporate digital responsibility. What digital responsibility do you have to make sure we're all included? 
And I don't want to be excluded just because I don't have high bandwidth, for example, because that's also causing digital exclusion. So messages that the corporations, the large corporations are really hearing now is we want to be included meaningfully. We want you to stop pretending like our part of the disability community can't add value. We have thousands of years to prove that's not true. And let's just make sure that we're really digging into what it, it means to be a human being. So societal expectations have changed dramatically and they were already changing dramatically before COVID-19 happened. And then COVID-19 happened. We see the younger generations vowing not to work for corporations that are not good players. Right now, after, you know, as we're in this uh, phase of COVID, um, we have the great resignation where we see people all over the world resigning from large corporations saying, I don't want to work for bad players or they're quitting jobs or they don't want to work or they're, it's just, there's a lot of changes happening that are really, really negatively impacting um, the workforce and society. And, um, but societal expectations have never been more expect, expecting, oh, I can't say the word, that's not the right word. Uh, we expect corporations to be good players. We really do. And if you're not, you're not including us, we're going to talk about you and you're not going to like what we have to say. So employers must do the right thing by their employees and by their customers and we also look at it from a brand perspective. I don't mind you talking about your brand, but don't do it at the expense of us and don't use language that hurts us. So anyway, there's a lot of scolding going on, but we also believe it's about identity and empowerment because once again, we're 1.3 billion people. If we came together, we hired from each other, we bought from each other, we supported each other, we complimented each other, we told each other stories, Think about it. I mean, we would be unstoppable as a community, but we don't do that right now. Most people, if they can um, not identify as being a person with a disability, they won't. If I can keep it hidden, I'm going to keep it hidden. Um, sometimes when we tell people that we have disabilities, like I talk about my neurodiversity, there's other members of the disability community that's like, well, that's not a real disability. Well, if it's not a real disability, why is it written in the laws? Okay, so we can't even decide if we have a disability or we don't. I know many members of the deaf community, for example, that have a lot of pride, do not consider that they have a disability. They, they consider they speak a different language, which is true. And so we have to take all that into consideration and we ourselves have to come together and we have to decide what is the right language how do we talk to each other? How do others talk about us? Because you know who's making the decisions now about that? Are the corporations. The corporations are gonna decide, are we called diversibility? Are we called people with determination? Are we called, uh, there's, you know, are we people first? Are we society first? Are we, there's a lot of confusion with identity. I think another really important thing I wanna bring up about identity is during the COVID-19, um, one thing that we saw here in the United States was more Americans with disabilities self-identified than ever before. Why? They didn't do it before because they felt they, could, they would be disadvantaged, which is probably true or discriminated against, but they're doing it now because they want to continue to telework because they find they're more productive, they can have a better work-life balance. So the reality is the lessons that we learned from COVID-19, if we forget them, we're going to see even more of people leaving the workforce, the great resignation that's happening. So we felt that this was the time to bring Billion Strong to life. But what we also did not want to do, we don't want to step over all these amazing, talented people that are already out there offering services to our community and for our community. So we want to really support entrepreneurs with disabilities. We want to turn up the volume on efforts like I sat on the USBLM board, which is now Disability In, for six years, and we created this certification of companies specifically owned by people with disabilities. As a matter of fact, one of those companies, John, has a company that's certified. And um, 
I think it's very important that we all become certified if we're entrepreneurs with disabilities and we're employing people with disabilities and we meet the criteria, but we need to come out and be proud of who we are. And I will say one more thing that happened that I thought was interesting was I have a friend of mine in the United Kingdom who had a CEO of a large tech company come to him and say, can you test to see if I'm dyslexic? And he's like, well, sure. How, how come? And he's like, oh, I think it'd be cool to be neurodiverse. So is it cool now to have a disability? I think it is. Is it sexy to have a disability? I think if you look at the picture of Dr. LaMondre here, and I forgot to describe myself early on, sorry, but I am a white woman with uh, gray hair and purple. I have purple hair too, because I figure if I'm going to be old, I'm going to have fun. And I have a background of Billion Strong logo behind me. And I'm very proud that Rue Global is uh, creating Billion Strong. So I forgot that because that's another thing that we can do just to make people feel included. We can have sign language interpreters if somebody speaks sign language. We can make sure that we describe ourselves if someone can't see to make sure everybody's having, you know, uh, not the same experience, but meaningful experiences. So when I was creating Billion Strong, I once again identify of it as having a disability and I'm a very important part of it as a mother and a wife. But one of the partners that I'd reached out to said, oh, good. Um, another white woman that doesn't look like she has a disability is going to start a disability organization. And I, being blunt here, but I, I was like sort of hurt by that comment because I thought, wow, I've been doing so much for this field, but I really did sit back and think about it. And he's right. We need to make sure that we're being very purposeful and representation matters like never before right now. So I actually um, made Dr. LaMondre Pugh the CEO of uh, Billion Strong. He's an amazingly talented man, amazingly talented entrepreneur, uh, wonderful communicator, has a, a really strong background. Um, he also happens to be a man. He has lived experiences as a man. He has lived experiences as an African-American living in the United States. He has experiences as Southern um, living in the southern part of the United States, and I'm from that part of the United States, and it is a little bit more prejudiced than the rest of our country. And I'm not just saying that. Go out and read the news if you don't think that's true. And, and then, of course, he also is a man with lived experiences with disabilities. He was born uh, with a form of muscular dystrophy, and his mom was told he would die before he was five, and then he would die before he was 11, and he walked, and then he and then he had to move into a wheelchair. He uses a power wheelchair. He has limited use of his body. Um, and he provides, uh, he, he get, has caregivers that provide him support. Um, but more importantly, he's a very, very talented CEO. And we're really blessed to have him um, running the, the corporation, the nonprofit. But at the same time, we all have to do it together, right? So I, and I'm, I'm well connected because I really appreciate all the wonderful people that are making a difference in our field. And so we have reached out and we have so far 85 country partners because you can't say you're Billion Strong and then not pull everybody together. And when I wanted to create Billion Strong and I started asking, I had people say, don't do it in the States. You are so confusing in the States, which is true. Uh, do it outside the States and then you can bring the States in later. And I'm like, no, I live in the United States. I'm proud to be an American. Do we have things we need to fix? Absolutely, but still, no, we're gonna be included. But then I have people say, well, just do it in the States first and we'll say we're global. No, I'm not doing that because we do that all the time in the States. No, we're one world. And so I went and I started deliberately reaching out to partners. Now, when I say I'm reaching out to partners, I'm reaching out to DPOs, Disability Persons Organization, also known as organizations of people with disabilities around the world. And there's so many efforts being made. But what are, being, what are the efforts that are being made in um, Ghana versus uh, Brazil versus you know, uh, Connecticut? Because remember, we are the United States. Every single state does it differently. So not only are we including all these wonderful countries, we want to include every single state as well. So 
And at the same time, a real barrier to entry is if you don't speak English, because Westerners convinced the world that English was the business of language. And so if you don't speak English and you're a young person with a disability in a country and you don't speak English, your chances of getting a job get even worse. So it's very important that we all come together. Certainly we're going to translate everything into the six UN languages, but we want all of the languages because we want to make sure people are included, including our refugees with disabilities. So, all right, I want to be, uh, make sure that I'm staying on time because I don't want um, to get yelled out by Meryl. Oh gosh, that would be terrible. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, at the same time, you cannot have this conversation if you don't include all of us. So I think it's great that we focus on, for example, Black women engineers. Yay. But why not Black women engineers with disabilities? You know, uh, let's support the LGBT community. They're amazing, talented people. But let's also support the LGBTQ that are part of the disability community. So the intersections have to be very deliberately looked at and included. And we have to make sure the voices from each of the communities are heard and listened to and stop trying to push everybody into the same box. It's, it's not fair to do that. So there's so many things on this slide right here, gender, military, respect, diversity. There's so many identity things happening right now. But I, I don't think that we've ever really dug into, could we be proud of being individuals with disabilities? So at the same time, we have all this beautiful technology happening and changing our world and enhancing our world, you know, driverless cars, smart glasses, the, app, the new Apple smart glasses are really cool, but they couldn't have done that if Google hadn't have tried to do it first, the exoskeletons, the printing, of, 3D printing of prosthetics, there's so much to be hopeful for, but at the same time, we continue to see a lot of technology created um, that's not accessible to us. So I am nagging the brands, you know, who are you? What are you doing? Talk to us about it. Let, let's make sure that, you know, you're not doing inspirational porn. We want you to include us, but in a thoughtful, meaningful way. Um, you don't always have to put disability right in my face. You can do it subtly like this honey made commercial here, which was a woman and a child and the woman's teaching, she's showing the child how to make a healthy snack. And then as the camera pulls back, you can see that the woman's in a wheelchair or the Dove commercial where the beautiful model um, is talking about how when she touches, when she puts the lotion on, the way it feels, the way it smells, the sensations of it. You don't have to have, you don't have to be able to see the lotion to really appreciate what the lotion is. So I love that. And then more and more, I have Microsoft here. I've got AT&T and Toyota that I could, I have slides and slides and slides of these kind of things. There's a lot of efforts being made to include us, including with movies and stuff, but there's still, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And of course, there's a direct path to the community you know, which are doing right now with A11Y New York City. There's a direct path to community. You can find us if you want to find us. You can find us whether we are individuals with disabilities or whether we're working in the field to make sure that people with disabilities are included. You are part of the community. As a matter of fact, Billion Strong, there's no, um, there's no membership fee to join. Everybody can join. We're going to get, we're going to do training. We're going to provide so much content, but what we're also going to do, which I want, I really think we should do more of. And I think once again, A11Y New York City has done a good job with this is we want to make sure we're telling other people's stories because it's not about Deborah Rue. I mean, it's partially about me, but it's also about, you know, what is Thomas Logan's equal entry? What do they do? What are they doing over there at A11Y New York City? Um, what are they, you know, what's happening in India? What's happening in China? What's, ha you know, wh what's happening all over the world that we can not only learn from and appreciate from, but also maybe utilize to help more people as well. So, there really is a direct path to the community now. There wasn't in the past, but there is. A lot of barriers have been broken down because of social media. Um, the community is active, engaged. We are a strong purchasing power, but and this is such a huge but. 
But the problem is we don't tell people who we are. So yeah, we're a strong purchasing power, but we don't say, listen, I'm not going to buy from you because you're not accessible. Instead, I'm going to move over here to this company. I mean, if we would go back to that old writing letters, even if it's just emails saying to CEOs, I'm, uh, and I did it, for example, I was with a, um, a big pharmacy company in the United States as a customer, and I switched to Walgreens. And the reason why I switched to Walgreens was because, and I had to move my pharmacy prescriptions, and it, it wasn't as easy as just going to a different store. There were some things I had to do, but I did it because I appreciate that Walgreens were making a commitment to hiring people with disabilities. And I appreciate that they were making their websites accessible. And, but then the competitor, their competitor that I left actually started doing it, but I, I didn't go back because it's too much trouble. So, but I did take the time to write a letter to both of the CEOs of the companies, the one that I went to and the one that left and told them why. So if we all did that, you know, we could really help change it even more. But there is a direct path to the community through social media, um, through bus to business to business, uh, business to consumers. There's a lot of ways to get to this community now. And it is bi-directional as well, because they will talk to you. Why not be polite and listen? Don't ignore what they're saying. Why are you leaving us out? Why are you creating videos that don't have captions? Things like that. Don't ignore us. Why are you? So uh, I, think it, it's, I think it's a real opportunity for us all. So this, uh, I didn't want to talk too much. I wanted to make sure that we could have a conversation, but I really do believe the business case has been clear for a long time. Technology is definitely redefining our workforce. <laughs> so is COVID. Um, societal expectations are changing so rapidly. And if you're not paying attention to them as an entrepreneur, as an individual, as a corporation, things are changing and we all have to be agents of change. And once again, if you're not familiar with the SDGs, once again, they're going to have um, an upcoming training on it. I personally think we should all be very familiar with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals that the world has committed to to come together to reduce the gender equity problems. Let's stop hunger. Let's clean up our oceans. All the things that we need to do to make sure we protect our beautiful earth, but at the same time, we protect all human beings. And we stop deciding that some, in, some human beings are not as important than others because they love the wrong person. They have the wrong color skin. They have a disability. Stop it. it we're just tired of that. So I, I believe that a lot of the changes that we see happening right now are gonna be very beneficial to our community. So I'm hopeful about it. So I'm just going to, and, and I'm happy, Cameron, to share this presentation with you. It, I have human potential yeah. at work. I run Access Chat, which, by the way, Cameron, you should come on Access Chat and talk about A11Y. Um, I'd love to and talk. then I'm an author, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to stop sharing because I, I so that we can have a conversation. Sure. Um, yeah. And Deborah, thank you so much. There's so much there and such a rich, uh, ecosystem to talk about with regards to uh, your work and the field. Uh, one thing that you touched on that I'd like to dig into specifically is um, sort of this idea of community, right? We're a community here with Access with ALMY and um, and the importance of having a sense of community in impacting change. One of the problems that we run into around community and disability is stigma. And especially in areas of uh, serious mental illness, um, but also in areas of, you know, like cognitive disorders and mental illness, uh, I think are particularly hard in uh, professional environments because you they, they're ignored from um, uh, diversity efforts often and you hear this trope like we hire the right person from the job. We don't for the job. We don't care if you're a woman or a, a black or brown person or you know. But when it comes to cognitive functionality and and behavioral concerns, uh, it's like crickets. <laughs> and this is something that's personally um, impactful. And I wonder what resources or or communities 
or um, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is your specific domain, but I wonder if you can point people to uh, some thought leaders in this space or resources um, about stigma with cognitive disability and more broadly stigma related to disability in the workplace. Yeah, there, there's so, that's a great question, Cameron. And there, there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of stigma and it, a lot of misinformation and a lot of people that, you know, when you, if you talk about our field, people with disabilities, the, the reality is that um, when you talk about disabilities, a lot of time people just assume you're talking about somebody that's in a wheelchair or somebody that has a certain service animal or a cane. And, and the, the thing that's also interesting about our community is we ourselves don't understand who's in our community. Isn't it fascinating to be part of a community that people don't even know they're part of your community? They don't even know it. I, I remember one time I was doing a presentation for a Jewish community center and they were saying, what do you think is our number one problem in the, in, you know, accessibility, disability inclusion? And I said, well, that nobody wants to be part of our, our team. <laughs> nobody wants to be part of this. And we, we hear right. stupid stuff like, um, I have a friend of mine that's blind that works for a large pharmaceutical company. His coworker told him he'd rather be dead than be blind. Mm. I, I don't know how that is conducive to a positive work environment, for example, right. but, but uh, I, there is a lot of work happening with that camera and there's a lot of efforts being yeah. made um, on those topics. And we are also um, working on those topics from the lens of technology as well. Because mm -hmm. when you look at like artificial intelligence, well, the data sets are all set towards white males, it, just because that's the way we've always done things in um, society. But we, we actually have to make sure that we're looking at all the diversity and um, the, all, all the other diversity groups as well, so that we have good, good data sets to select from. But there's a lot of work being done on those barriers on those misunderstandings, on the, um, you know, the racism, but it, it's breaking down identities. Right now, Elizabeth, the sign language interpreter, and I, for example, we both have she, her, hers. We have some identity out there. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we as society, and, you know, we're really digging into what it means to be mm -hmm. an individual. And so there's, there's so many resources that I, I don't even know where to begin, but I would say maybe sure. one place you would begin is go on to social media and look at those specific hashtags. But we're seeing very interesting conversations mm -hmm. around mental health. You know, uh, I can't tell my boss that I have any mental health issues. Right. Because that's, that's exactly what I'm, that's exactly what I'm yeah. after is like, and maybe this is like a completely different, uh, like, no, it's a great, you know, it's a great topic, point. but it, it's, it's about identity. There, right? it's about identity, and 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 just the, the idea that self-identifying could could be risky. And I yes. think acknowledging and it, that, it is, right? Yeah. And the other day, I was I was talking to a, somebody, some people that worked for a lo real large brand in their employee resource groups, and they were they were all happen to be from the States and, and you'll see why that's relevant. And they said to me, well, what is Bullion Strong going to do to protect us? Now, as an American, I know what that means. <laughs> I know how we sue each other in the United States, but I said to them, well, we're not going to do that. What Bullion Strong is not going to do is go and start suing people. We have other companies, we have other organizations doing that. And I'm really glad. I'm sorry you have to be sued, but if you're not including us, I'm tired of it. So sorry, but mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, what do we actually do to be successful? Yeah. I, I think that's more important. And so some of the, I'm seeing some interesting things like men talking about how men handle depression, because by the way, men handle mm. depression differently from women. They just do. Mm -hmm. And younger men handle it differently than older men, just because of cultural differences. So we're seeing a lot of efforts, a lot of conversations about this. We also awesome. are seeing, which I think is really cool too, in that we're, we're seeing leadership training for managers to understand how to deal with people that are in trauma. Because the reality mm -hmm. is we're all in trauma right now. 
We are. Yeah. My brother-in-law died suddenly on Monday. It was, and he died because they couldn't get in my bed because it was overrun with COVID-19. That's very traumatic, yeah. right? Yeah. I, know, I know it's so sad. But at the same time, everybody's walking trauma. So yeah. how do you lead people on your team if they're traumatized? So anyway, I'm not really answering the question because it's a big yeah, question. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, it's it's not a fair question in a way because it's just so it's, uh, it's so per- poignant. But um, so, okay, so I want to pause here for a second and open the floor. Um, Mark, Mark McGuire, uh, do you want to go ahead and, and un, uh, uh, unmute your video and ask your question. So uh, this is Mark speaking and I have a question. Uh, I'm curious about what Billion Strong's plans are for next year, 2022. And um, greetings to Mark. Mark's a good buddy of mine with Access Chat. He's been a big part of the community at Access Chat, so we love him. Um, And that's a great question. And I'll tell you, Mark, you know me. And um, I really like to make sure that everybody's included. And so we have, like I said, 85 country partners. So one thing that I was doing was I want to get out on our website what those countries are doing, not make it so much about Billion Strong, make about, you know, start telling the stories. But one of my board members said, I I don't think we should do that. It's great, let's let's do that, but let's focus on an event first. Meaning, what can we do as Billion Strong to really help? What's, What's something we could start with? And so we're starting with a hard one, and this is the first time I've talked about it. So uh, this will be announced here. But what we want to work on first in 2022, as she takes a breath, um, we really want to talk about, can we all come out and identify? You know, Mark, can you come out and identify that you're deaf and you use ASL like you have right now, identified in the window? Um, Can you, could we, will we put this on our bios? Could we put this in our email signature lines? Could we put this on our resumes? Well, wait a minute. We were told in the past, don't put personal stuff on your resumes. Don't say you're a um, talented individual that stuff and they get all these byproducts because you've already had to learn to think outside the box because the world wasn't made to include you. And um, can we do that with pride? But what are the risks? once again, to our community, if we do that to us. But they're becoming less risk now because, um, and I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. So I was talking to a colleague of mine that's in the Philippines and she's blind. And she had a friend of hers that is also blind say, I'm applying for a job. Should I tell them I'm blind or should I wait till I get the interview? And then they're going to figure it out. And so my colleague recommended she not tell them which by the way is standard practice. We don't tell people on our resumes or our CVs that we have disabilities, that's standard. Um, But so so she didn't tell him, she went to the interview. The interviewer was actually mad that she didn't tell him and the interview didn't go well and she didn't get the job. Now, the reality is, and we all know this, if she had told the woman beforehand that she was blind, she would never have gotten the interview. We just know that. So what do we do? Well, now we have 500 major corporations with the valuable 500, along with the World Economic Forum, that has said, we do want to hire you. We do. We want to hire people with disabilities. Where are you? Where do we find you? So I think one of the first projects we're going to do in 2022 is we're going to start a campaign to talk to the community about whether or not we should come out proudly and say on every place where we identify ourselves that we are individuals with disabilities. Can we do it? Can we support each other? I mean, it's it's interesting. Everything we're talking about has risks because sometimes our community gets mad at each other a lot. If you've ever seen on, you know, oh, thank you, Carlos. But so that's that's what we believe we should start with because think about the identity stuff we got to deal with with that. So how do you present it? Well, how do you present it in one country over another country? Um, it, it, it's it's just a it's a deep conversation. But also, who are you, Mark? For example, as an individual, what do you want? What part of your identity do you want to 
telepostal employer. And is there an advantage to companies like yours and John Kirkland, I know, is on here, who has his own company, for corporations to know their vendors are owned by persons with disabilities and they're committed to hiring people? Does that give you a leg up as a vendor to get selected more, you know, through? So that, that's what we're going to work on. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um yeah, it a, it, and it's so funny because it goes exactly to what we were just talking about, self-identification and like, and and reconciliation of of that uh, that complexity, right? Like, like it's it's um, yeah, it's it's being able to support one another in that step, and sort of having like a a, a groundswell initiative. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe when we all um, have a unified voice around our identity as people with disabilities, then it's it's undeniable, right? Yeah, so I, 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 I think it's a good way, place to start because it's, well, it's a little bit of a complex problem, but it also digs right into it. And once again, employers are actually looking for us. And if more people knew that you were specifically being looked for because of your talent and because you had a disability, there would be a reason to do that. And, and I want to make a comment that I forgot. I, I didn't finish when I was talking about that group that was the large corporation. Mm -hmm. One of the employees in the States had said, what are you going to do to protect us? And I said, we're not going to sue you people. But the reality is if enough of us come together, really come together and start talking about who we are and that we're proud of who we are and society needs to wake up. And also at the same time, I said to this woman that said that I said, um, well, you have to remember also you were, you have privilege because you were born in the United States, which is a developed country. Goodness knows the United States is not perfect, but it has advantages to be you know, over um, some other countries, be developed versus non-developed or worn, torn things and stuff. I, so I said, at a certain point, us Americans have to be brave and we need to make sure that we'll stand up for our brothers and sisters in the other countries. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, at this point, we all need to be brave and we need to say, I'm tired of people not being included. I'm tired. We need mm -hmm. to all raise hell when we see um, any kind of, um, you know, politician or information out there and then have sign language interpreters. We mm -hmm. need to start raising more hell when we're not included. And I and we need to come together and be proud. And, and I think often people don't think of our community and think of pride. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we're going to have speakers bureaus. We're going to have mentoring. We're going to have master classes. And the master classes will be done with people people that have disabilities that are very proud of their lived experiences. We, we want to really talk more about the intersections and there's some conversations happening with that, but at the same time, don't put any indexes in place that don't say that don't have accessibility included. It's ridiculous. And you know, AWY, y'all need to be everywhere. Y'all need to be everywhere. You need to be in every every single country in the world. So what we want to mm. do is we want to talk about who's doing it right so that funders can find them. We want mm. to fund entrepreneurs with disabilities. We want to set up an impact fund. What if we funded ourselves? Right now we see funding, and I'll give you another example that some of y'all might've heard of, but there is, uh, during the International Paralympics, which just happened, it just ended at the uh, uh, beginning, the end of September, um, they create, they've created a new campaign called hashtag we the 15, we the 15. And it's about uh, the 15% of the world that have disabilities and coming out in pride. And so they're one of our customers. So they told us what we were doing. We started, um, you know, turning up the volume for them because we're not competitors. We're all in this together. But now I had nothing to do with this, but they used an accessibility overlay tool. Well, <laughs> yeah, Twitter got hold of them and people started raising cane about them not being accessible um, the way we consider you're accessible. And so um, I sent him a note and said, How, can we help you? And but they corrected it themselves. But still, you can make mistakes. People forget 
the accessibility should not be an um, afterthought, but it often is. So there's so much work to do, even with the identity conversations. Yeah, I appreciate that. And and it is, there is so much to do and it is sometimes overwhelming, but I think, uh, yeah, just taking it a step at a time and, and, and people like you leading um, is super helpful. So thank mm-hmm. you for that. We're, um, we have a few more minutes. So I, I welcome uh, more questions. I see that John said something to the point of increasing. Well, and he might want to say this himself instead of me reading it, but I see that John Kirkland. Um, yeah, John, you, you, you're, you're welcome to uh, take the stage as it were. And, and, and you uh, hear me. yes, we yes. can. Wow. All right. I didn't even know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so don't see anything bad. Yeah. Deborah, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. We've been been uh, circling this field for quite a while, haven't we? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, two, I, I definitely found your, your points interesting around uh, cognitive accessibility and uh, and the employment in that area and uh, uh, even self-disclosure, which is something that I dealt with directly uh, for quite a while. And uh, it was very, very interesting. And uh, uh, there's a lot that, that needs to be done. And it's a, it's a difficult area. Uh, I also want to say, too, and hence the link that's in that I put into uh, the chat there, uh, being on the W3C on the Cognitive Accessibility Guidelines uh, Task Working Group and Task Force, uh, we're looking to increase the accessibility of the internet. Uh, and we're really trying to get heads together around how cognitive accessibility is really being, uh, can be applied in the internet uh, world. Uh, we, um, we, as was touched upon a point a bit there, you know, there are the different lanes essentially of disability and, and uh, different advocates in, in the areas and, uh, you know, each, each organization advocating for their own, you know, needs. And, uh, but with the W3C, for example, it's covering all disabilities. And so that you have uh, these cross functionalities coming into play. And uh, uh, we really want to increase, especially with cognitive bubbling up in, in the whole area of accessibility. And uh, in even let's, let's, I don't know if this is a politically correct way of putting it, but like mainstreaming a bit more where people are realizing we're all going to have a disability at one point due to aging. And we're not going to be able to function at, at the same level. And we will need assistance. How can technology assist us all? So it's a fascinating field. We need more participation. Uh, feel free to contact me and also uh, put the link into the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force of the W3C. Uh, it's really a great effort and it's a global effort. And we just need uh, we need more people on it, frankly, and uh, love to to communicate with anyone around this. And John, I will tell you that I was on the first working group of the cognitive. I oh, was, All right. you know, I did it for several years, but boy, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> they work so hard. So uh, I, yeah, but before, before what, how we tried to deal at tech access, how we tr- tried to do with cognitive was usability. But yeah. actually, it needs to be addressed differently. So I'm really glad that W3C is doing it. And, and there's so much more to it, as John said. Yeah. Once again, this is about people. I mean, I'm 62, and I definitely, it, my body is different than it was. It, it, it is. And I don't, now, once again, I've also, like all of us, I'm in trauma. So, you know, my, I don't seem to think as well. I forget things. I drop things. So, we first acknowledge we're in trauma, but we need it to be more cognitively considered. So it actually all of the work that they're doing helps all of us. And, and that's what I always say too. And I know others yeah. are saying it. accessibility benefits everyone. Everything you do for accessibility, if you do it right, it benefits everyone. But there's also this one man that's always on access chat that's saying, oh, W3 standards are so stupid. You don't need it. And you don't need assistive technology. Okay, 
what? So it's sort of buyer beware too, especially, and the corporations are seeing that as well. And I'm always telling them, take the time to do your due diligence. Take the time to do your due diligence because there's money being spent in this field that is actually hurting our community. And some of y'all probably know what I'm talking about and I'm not going to be mean and say it, but yeah, there's, yeah, I'm, we can't stop this. We, we can't yeah. Keep doing this we've got to really really uh, focus more and training which equal entry has always done such a great job with training everybody mm. needs to be trained on accessibility every single year because it's all you know it's we need training awesome well on just a closing note i'd like everyone to take away a couple actionable things from this conversation the the most clear action that we can take right now uh, is to join Billion Strong. So billionstrong.org, the link is there in, uh, in the, the chat, in the Zoom chat. And um, is there anything else, Deborah, that you can leave us with in terms of like going out into the world and, and, and taking a part in this, uh, in this movement? Well, uh, thank you, Cameron, first of all, once again, for having me, but for uh, encouraging everybody. It's free, and we need the numbers, so please join us, billion-strong.org. Um, but at the same time, make sure that you're telling others about what you're hearing me talk about today, because what we're seeing is a lot of people don't even understand what's happening. And if you are not, and I say this corporations all the time, you want the best talent, but you're not accommodating us. You're not including us. Your, your, your systems aren't accessible, which says to me, you don't really want to include me. I'll go and work for somebody else. So if this great resignation that's happening is really, really having an impact on the employers. And so I think it's actually an opportunity. So if you're in this field and you really care about this work, start looking at some of the, some of the things that are happening to a societal and be thinking about what's coming next, because we are breaking down what it means to have, I, to be in our, our identities. We're breaking down our identities, but accessibility is not a nice to have. It's, you know, it's not, it, I always say privacy is not a nice to have, security is not a nice to have. You must be private and it's secure, but you also have to be accessible. And I just, I'm tired of it always being an, how in the heck yeah. can this still be an afterthought? How? This is ridiculous. Sorry. I'm so happy you joined us, Deborah. I'm so happy that all of you joined us at the New York City Accessibility Meetup. Thank you, Cameron.